So I hope everyone can see my screen at this point. And uh, if you can't, well, then I'm sure I'll hear pretty quickly if there's an issue here. So looking good, Roderick. Looking good. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I want to go and, and start with uh, saying about the educational objective. You know, I, I thought it was a, a great opportunity to present something educational around the subject of trends. Uh, it's a little bit different than the norm, but as an industry, it's incredibly important that we keep our finger on the pulse of technology and new advances and really what's happening from a social perspective to make sure that we're delivering the types of projects and buildings that the public needs. But part of that process means going back and examining uh, which trends perhaps didn't come to fruition in the past. And this is the second time that John and I have done this webinar. And the first time uh, we spoke quite confidently about the trends that were going to come to fruition in 2022. And uh, I'm reading all these recaps uh, of 2022 at the end of the year, people making their bold prognostications. I realized what's entirely missing from the, the discourse is anyone going back and offering a, a bit of a review of, of what they got right and what they got wrong. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity for us to do exactly that. And the thinking here is that if you're able to do that and you understand why, um, it can lend a more critical evaluation of trend evaluations for 2023. Um, as they say, you know, the, the history is oftentimes a fantastic predictor of the future. Um, so we're going to look back on the, our last webinar that we did almost a year ago exactly and look at those trends. But of course, with that, we're looking to 2023 and we're going to hopefully uh, make some similarly accurate, bold predictions for this coming year. And one of the, the biggest trends that we're seeing right now emerging really uh, on a just almost a um, uh, at a rate that's almost scary, to be perfectly honest, is the rise of artificial intelligence. Uh, we're obviously seeing it quite a bit uh, coming from the Enscape side as a software man, um, manufacturer. You know, we have to be keenly aware of how this tool can be used to advance the design experience of all of our customers. But as you could imagine, uh, this is an incredible challenge from an educational perspective. And that's why I'm absolutely so delighted to be sharing this webinar with John, who can really speak to how the educational system needs to respond. And something that John and I often know is that being passive simply is not an option in the face of this type of, of technology. You, you can't assume that um, everything's going to be just fine. Rather, you have to get ahead of it and really teach your students uh, how to, to work with this technology and to make it part of essentially their, their toolkit, if you will. So this will be something incredibly exciting. And also lastly, just to echo Aaron's comment about questions, something that John and I really enjoy is, is challenging questions from the audience. Uh, ones that, that put us on the spot, make us rethink our assumptions. So please take advantage of that um, the Q&A section um, within the, the Zoom interface here. And we look forward to picking those up at the end of the webinar. So let's look back at our trends from 2022, and maybe some of you joined us for that, that past webinar, maybe some of you did not. But one of the things that we got right, and it's always good to start with your successes, uh, makes you feel pretty good about things, um, was a trend that we at Enscape had started to see actually amongst our customers, and, and something that was a little bit of a surprise, but it was really about data visualization. And we as a software provider are used to people using Enscape and real-time visualization to show designs. How is your building going to look? Uh, how do we make that design engaging so that say client groups or stakeholder groups can see those designs, um, understand them in a way that's intuitive and help facilitate uh, quick decision-making. But one of the things that we found is that people are actually taking our software and using it to create visualizations around more traditional data type considerations. Like how do you say uh, prepare an RFP response, but make a cost escalation chart exciting? How do you make that something that people want to engage with? And we actually found that people were using Enscape and say embedding little QR code links like you're seeing here to actually make that data something that people can interact with and see within say with their phone in a more immersive type environment. It doesn't change the data. Um, maybe it improves the legibility, but it certainly alters engagement. And I can speak to the, the veracity of that by the fact that we actually use that internally at the chaos group for our internal trends reports, where we look at data that typically isn't of interest across the entire organization, in this case, the architectural billing index, 
Um, but we actually visualize it in Enscape, and we're finding that the level of engagement has gone up significantly just by altering the way that people engage that data. So I would say this is a, a very interesting trend. We expect this to grow quite a bit, uh, but making things that perhaps are a little dry, more exciting, uh, is I think is something that uh, we can all acknowledge the benefit of. So what else did we get right? What else was a, a big trend that uh, had some significant play here? One of them was about building performance. You know, we I don't think it, it takes a, um, you know, a crystal ball of any real uh, accuracy to to know that building performance and carbon awareness are are growing trends. Uh, but it's one that we predicted at least in 2022 would really go mainstream. Um, it would be one that would, would no longer be sort of the reserve of the people that were considered themselves environmentalists or, or concerned with uh, climate change, but really would become this de facto. And we certainly did see that happen, but what caught us by, uh, a little bit off guard was that it didn't happen for the reasons that we predicted. Um, it's hard to, to imagine and, uh, that energy costs really weren't Yes, they were they were high, but they weren't really where they were in 2022. But over the course of that year, uh, they increased significantly, globally speaking, across multiple energy types. And when you're designing a building and the cost of running that building from an operations perspective to heat and cool it, to light it, things like that is doubling, all of a sudden energy performance becomes significantly more important, both to the client group and, of course, to the designers as well. And we saw that being a very dramatic shift that occurred over the last year. Um, so when people are thinking about, well, how do I have a resilient building? And maybe it's not just withstanding environmental um, uh, issues, but it's also about withstanding these types of economic and price, uh, price fluctuation challenges. So from where we were, we saw this uh, this carbon awareness, concern about emissions, um, and really fundamentally um, operational energy become uh, to the absolute forefront of concern. Fortunately, all these things are, are tied together. Um, so while we are generating more efficient buildings that are cheaper to operate, um, you're also reducing emissions as well. Um, so I would say in some ways, you know, sort of the silver lining to that cops cloud, if you will. Something else that we are keenly watching as a software company, uh, because it has direct implications about how people use and our software and how they interact with the other colleagues that are using the software as well as client groups, is the rise of, of the hybrid workplace. And in 2022, we saw hybrid truly becoming the new normal. And this is certainly the case. Um, I think you can tell by uh, perhaps just the fact of your own work uh, life uh, cycle or the people you interact with, say via Zoom or other interfaces that oftentimes they're in the office and oftentimes they're not in the office. And it's truly become that type of hybrid work environment. Um, in my experience that it's never, or it's rarely one uh, exclusively or the other. Um, it's oftentimes a mix of the two. And from our perspective, seeing this trend really start to solidify has a number of implications. One is that we have to be keenly aware of how a software um, can function across these multiple domains. How does it able to be seamless at the at the work, say, offsite work environment versus the traditional office environment? And what does that mean in the context of, say, um, interacting with all the uh, various other software that are part of a traditional SaaS ecosystem that's at play in, in a contemporary design firm? As you can see by the, the top application or the top uh, view there, I always ask people when I speak to, to various companies how they say manage their new facilities or they manage their facilities under a hybrid environment. And, and oftentimes they're using uh, various softwares that allow for them to say manage hot desk or check out different uh, zones, um, be able to keep track of where hardware is and things like that. Um, so we're really seeing that uh, be a significant trend and we wanna to respond to that as a software um, to make sure that it works under all these various deployment circumstances and of course the associated hardware and internet connectivity that's gonna come with those different deployment circumstances. We're also seeing this start to influence the type of architectural projects that are happening. When we look very closely at these trends, we're seeing a dramatic rise in the number of renovation projects. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this may be happening, but one of the ones that we hear from speaking with our customers that are obviously with designers is that people are recognizing that how 
buildings were designed prior to this rise of the hybrid work environment essentially doesn't work as effectively as it should under this new context. So buildings and offices are being renovated to adapt to this hybrid work environment. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that the offices oftentimes become a place where, A, you have to support this type of hot desking, um, but the offices also become these centralized locations for collaboration. So it's when you have a meeting that requires interaction with multiple parties where you want to come up with the big ideas or maybe solidify relationships, you need to be able to do that in a new type of environment than the traditional office. So as a result, offices are being rethought, they're being redesigned, and the amount of renovation projects is increasing quite significantly. So we can't talk about all the things we got right without offering a little bit of a mea culpa and, and going into the things that we got wrong. Um, and I don't necessarily feel like I want to call out the metaverse as a trend that we really thought would be um, absolutely catching on like wildfire in 2022 and say that it's gone. Um, I still think that it's, it's something that will continue to grow and develop with us. But I will say that in our last trends report, um, and perhaps me more than John, was firmly convinced that this was going to be the next big thing. Um, and I will say maybe it'll be the next big thing after a couple of other things at this point. So there's always a question of, well, why? Uh, why do we miss the mark in the context of the metaverse? And there's a number of reasons why I think that we, we basically miss the boat to, to some degree. But a big part of it is that the metaverse currently functions as a series of discrete islands. Uh, these metaverse environments, and these are the ones when people think about traditional metaverse environments, there's some examples here. You can see that they all have different types, for instance, of file formats that they support when it comes to actually creating the sort of the, the environment or the architecture of those metaverses. So that means that if you create something for one, it won't necessarily transfer over to another. And that same type of inner lack of interoperability also translates to other things that maybe the, say, um, the clothing or something like that, or certain types of digital assets that you might have associated with an avatar in one metaverse can't just seamlessly move to another. So in a sense, you can't retain your personality, if you will, from one place to another unless you completely recreate it. Additionally, there's issues of, say, like currency um, translating between the two. Um, and those really, I think, at the end of the day, because they're discrete islands, you have to make it a very compelling environment. Um, and maybe individually, it could be quite successful, but it isn't really part of this seamless metaverse in which it's a digital world where we can move from one place to another. Um, so while people like, say, kids may love Roblox, they're not going from Roblox to Mona or to Somnium space in some sort of seamless fashion. They're really staying within that little metaverse world. And I think as a result, you're not seeing this sort of knock-on radiative effect where um, you're, you're starting to see the whole metaverse grow because of the fact that you can go from one place to another. And, and they really experience it in a way that people are almost used to in the context of, say, like the World Wide Web, where you can just really go to any website that you can type in the address for. But there's also some serious issues around hardware, and these really can't be ignored. Uh, one of the great things about my job is I get to talk to a lot of customers and I'm always asking about virtual reality um, and understanding how important it is in the context of their workflow. And what's interesting is it's very much so a binary response that I get. People either say that it's incredibly important, um, it really allows for us to, to interact with space in new and novel ways and communicate ideas, and other people have a very high level resistance. And a lot of that resistance is based off the fact that it's the goggles themselves, that nobody wants to be the person putting on a set of VR goggles and have everyone else look at them while they're almost completely removed from, from their physical context. So there's an aspect of that, that social component that um, really at this point is unresolved. And, and maybe it'll become something that'll be less of an issue, that people have less of a, of a hardware concern. Um, and I think there's some good precedent for that being the case. So those of us a certain age may remember when Google Glass was a thing and people had early release copies and you'd see them on the street wearing Google Glasses. And I remember reading articles 
uh, about people going into bars with Google Glasses on and getting in altercations and maybe getting popped in the nose or what have you because people didn't like to be recorded um, or just the connotation associated with this type of, of sort of technology and this wearable technology. And I think at this point, you would see nothing of that sort. Um, you know, Google Glass wouldn't even cause an eyebrow to be raised. And a lot of that has to do with is the normalization of a certain amount of technology. And I think that in the context of VR, it's quite likely that there is a normalization that also will have to occur. Um, and that's one that will also be predicated upon the, the, the hardware itself becoming more portable, more streamlined, um, and also uh, looking into further development of the augmented reality aspect, where it's not completely disassociating you from your physical environment, but you can still see the people around you and things like that. So there's certainly a component there, but at the end of the day, there's always going to be a cost consideration. The costs are going down. Um, and then right now too, that with the hardware, there's a relationship between hardware and visual quality. And this is something that we as a software company really struggle with, is that particularly when you look at wireless headsets, uh, there's just an inherent challenge in reproducing really high quality visualizations in the context of what that type of hardware can support. Um, and from I think we all know that hardware is getting more and more powerful. It's no surprise. Uh, and we suspect the same thing, or, and, and I think quite accurately, will happen in the context of VR goggles um, and augmented reality technology, so that uh, the need for large goggles that maybe don't support uh, the best type of visual experience um, will really start to erode and you'll get better and better experiences and, and more and more streamlined hardware at a lower and lower cost. But that lack of quality really isn't something um, that should be glossed over. Uh, when you think about it, particularly from a design perspective, we're concerned about things like materials, uh, textures, and maybe nuance the way interplay of light. Um, and things like that. And when you have a low quality environment, like you do in a lot of these metaverse places, you know, it really does start to reduce the level of engagement that one has. So if you look at that top image up there, you look at it from that decentralized environment, it's interesting, but it's not really visually engaging. You know, you're not really seeing the nuance of sand. You're not seeing the water in a way that looks realistic or, or looks like a place, frankly, you want to be. Um, it, you know, it looks highly simplified. But then you look at what is a contemporary gaming environment in the middle, and it's incredibly compelling. You know, this looks like the kind of place where you can really start to understand detail. You can understand nuance. And frankly, it's not, um, it's a place that you want to explore and you want to start to see the petals and the flowers and things like that. Um, so this type of, of high quality resolution is, is actually, from my perspective and our perspective, one of the major reasons why the, the metaverse hasn't taken off yet. Uh, but we certainly expect that that's going to improve. Um, but along with that, though, there's some major challenges when you think about just the scale of where it has to go. And on the bottom, there's an example of a chair that may be considered a, an appropriate asset for visualization and architectural applications. And it has around 44,000 or so polygons, uh, which is a lot, but it's not outrageous. Uh, but you compare that to a building in the Decentraland metaverse environment, and that's more polygons than you can have for an entire building in Decentraland. So there's this right now, at least, an incredible mismatch between that. And a lot of that is about hardware limitations um, that, that simply don't support this higher level of resolution. And like I said, we suspect that's going to change, but we do think that that's one of the things that's going to be a major hurdle that'll have to be overcome before people really want to start to engage with, with metaverse environments. And then the last piece uh, that we think is, is quite important here is about the value of being somewhere in person. And this is something that John and I talk about quite a bit, which is somewhat ironic because it's been a while since we've met in person, John. We should probably fix that. Uh, but there's no doubt about it that there is a value in meeting in person. And I will say that the, the times that John and I have met in person and had face-to-face, -face, you know, that, that value continues to pay dividends in the context of our relationship. And I think anyone from a professional environment knows that when you have something really important you need to communicate or you really need to develop consensus or formalize a, a partnership, um, there's something to be said for being there in person, to breaking bread to together um, that has incredible value. And that's one of the things that you 
you simply can't replace um, in, with a metaverse type environment. And so it's not to say that there isn't a time and place for this, those sort of immersive environments. And, and there's not that there isn't value there. And it's not that you can't have great relationships. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there simply is no replacement for the in-person experience. And so from our perspective, that's one of the things where the metaverse environment, you know, it needs to be acknowledged as maybe sort of one piece of that, that social and interaction toolkit, um, but it's not one that is going to be able to supplant that in-person interaction. Oh, that's right. And this is oh, actually, it wasn't quite the right the last thing and I forgot to mention, of course, uh, is the underlying technology in a lot of metaverse environments is the idea of um, blockchain and that there is a capacity for ownership um, predicated upon blockchain technology. And this is something you see both with the way that things are paid, whether or not the clothes that you're wearing in a metaverse environment are really the ones that you're sort of allowed to wear and things like that. And what's interesting here is that we've seen a lot of pullback from people's sort of, at one point incredibly high enthusiasm around blockchain and NFTs. And part of that is really a um, uh, the repercussions of the FTX fallout. Uh, so here you had an entity that was really all about um, cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency exchange, but it used components of this technology, obviously, for that. And so when people hear that this company went belly up and that, uh, you know, they're, they're begin to think of this technology as being a little bit more of a, a smoke and mirrors proposition than having real value, which isn't necessarily the case. Uh, but there is a reputational impact, if you will, from a social uh, perspective. So we see that. Um, as a result, you know, Bitcoin uh, lost a lot of value. Um, and Justin Bieber, who bought his Bored Ape NFT there for 1.3 million, um, his current valuation uh, is around 70,000 or perhaps even less today. So this is one of those things where um, there's, there's this interesting effect that's happening from a social perspective where one of these core underlying technologies that enables the metaverse has really been devalued uh, within larger society, at least currently. But we, we certainly believe it's going to rebound uh, eventually. Okay, 2022 in recap, and, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing some, some questions and whatnot to facilitate discussion around uh, if we're continue to be wrong or maybe we, we thought we were right, but in fact we weren't. Uh, so on and so forth. But we do want to look to 2023. And there's a lot of different trends that John and I thought we could uh, approach, but we really wanted to focus on AI. Because from our perspective, uh, it has, first of all, grown so quickly um, that it's really worth an exploration. If you look at, say, ChatGTP, it's rise from up to 100,000 or uh, over 100,000 users um, was faster than any other commercial software in the history of mankind. Um, if you, you know, obviously, you know, that's sort of a limited sample size, but it does show how rapidly that technology went from basically zero to 100, um, in this case, around two and a half months, which is incredibly fast. So one of the things that we found in the context of AI is a lot of it, particularly unique applications. Um, for instance, we as a software company are always about improving the visual quality of our renderings and our rendering capabilities that we give to our customers. But we're starting to hear from more and more customers. They don't always want photo real. They want to communicate ideas. And sometimes that takes a photo real image. Sometimes it takes something that's a little bit more stylized. And so we're actually seeing a lot of our customers use AI to take something out of Enscape and then almost detune it in such a way that it has more emotional, artistic qualities to it. Um, this has been a, a very interesting trend for us to watch and something that, as you can see here, is actually out of our own research lab. Um, we're focusing on different ways of perhaps bringing something like this to our customers. 3D assets is an interesting one. It's always been for us a, a challenging bottleneck, bringing assets that work in a real-time visualization context. And it takes a, typically a, a high level of artistic skill to create something that looks good, um, but is still very lightweight from a, a data perspective to function in the context of Enscape. Uh, but what we're seeing is a future very honestly can't be that far out where you're creating 3D assets using very basic inputs into an AI engine, a photograph or two. 
and you can create a compelling 3D asset, or you have an existing 3D asset and you can create variations of it very rapidly leveraging AI. Um, this is something that uh, has gone from maybe a few research papers, uh, for instance, in this case, put out by NVIDIA Labs, uh, to something that we suspect will be in the marketplace in a way that's going to be absolutely usable uh, for our audience in short order. There's also the use of AI to start to sort data, because um, obviously with AI and, and with this architecture as an industry as a whole, we create enormous reams of information. And how do you support sort that information right now? It's, it's sort of your typical keyword search, or you're looking through tags and things like that. Um, but we see an opportunity for AI to become a much more intelligent and almost intuitive search partner, looking through these, these big data sets, these big buckets to find right, exactly the right information that you're looking for. And then from there, of course, you know, we're perhaps manipulating in such a way that it's perfectly tuned for your application. Now, something else that we're definitely keeping an eye on and we're seeing um, really rise up in popularity, and, and part of this is because almost every customer that I talk to about AI and I ask them about Verus in this particular case, and they're saying they're using it, um, is actual plugins for generating visualizations through uh, some basic text prompts that are manipulated through an AI engine. One of the things I was saying to John earlier that impressed me most about Verus is they're able to make that Revit advanced sample project look like a, a compelling piece of architecture. Um, so you know they're onto something pretty impressive if they're able to do that. And from my perspective, this is the type of technology that uh, a company like um, Enscape needs to be keenly aware of because we can see this as an incredibly powerful companion to the type of traditional user interface that we might offer. Um, and as you can see from the qualities of the visualization, they're, they're really not bad, uh, to be honest, they're actually quite good. And they provide a really effective way of rapid design exploration. How can I just subtly change aspects of it, maybe to generate ideas? Maybe this isn't trying to be that perfect visualization that shows exactly what's going to be built. But it shows a lot of really compelling ideas very quickly that allow for designers to do what they do best, which is to, to take these ideas and really bring them into some type of design that could be constructed. And that yields, I think, what we see as one of the big components here of AI, which is the rebirth of really artificial intelligence driven design itself. Um, so this isn't just about a visualization, but it's actually about using a series of, of inputs um, and constraints predicated upon a particular location and programmatic requirement for a project to actually create a design itself. And we see this as something that a lot of the components are already there. Um, they're just sort of begging to be put together. And some people may remember the original Flux Metro project that came out uh, almost 10 years ago. And for those that saw it, I recall there being a uh, incredibly negative reaction on the part of the design community to the software where you can put in zoning requirements, location, environmental uh, constraints, programmatic requirements. And then from that, generate a piece of architecture. And there's no doubt that the architecture it generated, I would say, would be um, was poor from a design perspective, but it did fit the rules, so to speak, but people hated it. Um, and I think we're seeing a very different era now where both AI is a heck of a lot better, but also people simply don't have that same uh, fear of AI as they might have had a few years ago. Um, and partly because it's really proven to be so so good. Um, as this companion that allows for um, sort of rapid idea generation. And so we suspect in the future that people are going to be comfortable with AI far more so to the degree that they're actually willing to use it to start to generate some additional forms, massing, and ideas. Um, and from that, it starts to raise questions about, well, then what is in fact that the role of, of the designer in that context? You know, if you actually have AI generating the building for you, so before I hand this over to John and he talks about the educational implications and, and what this means really from a uh, pedagogic perspective, uh, something that we see in the context of Enscape and as we think about the ways that our software needs to adapt to this, um, essentially this new AI future, uh, there's some aspects of, of what we wanna to provide to the designer um, that really start to fit into their new role. 
And one of the key components of that new role is that the designer becomes, as we like to think of it, the master of prompts. They are the conductor, whereas uh, AI maybe is just a tool. It's an extremely sophisticated tool, but it's a tool that does in many ways what you tell it to do. But we need to learn to speak its language and understand what those prompts are. How do you get it to essentially start to resonate where your prompts yield the outcome that you desire? And this is something that we, we feel is incredibly important. The other thing that we feel is incredibly important for designers to be is that, that confident voice of quality assurance, if you will, that's willing to push back on AI to really make sure that the project is, is meeting those requirements with respect to health, safety, welfare, things like that. And one of the challenges that I, I feel is that AI is so intelligent in a way um, that it takes a lot of confidence in a way to, to push back on it, to say, no, this isn't right. Um, in fact, um, as, as a designer, I know that this isn't right and that it, that's going to be a, a new skill set that I feel that, that designers are going to have to, to develop in response to AI as a tool. You simply can't trust its outputs. It'll be maybe right 90% of the time and horribly wrong 10% or maybe even 5%, but that horribly wrong can be extremely serious. So there's a real responsibility on the part of designers when using AI as a tool. Another component that I really, actually one of the things I love most about uh, architectural industry is that at the end of the day, it's about putting something in the ground um, or it's about creating a physical environment, perhaps it'd be a better way of putting it. And at the end of the day, AI is not going to literally build that building. Um, that's still a physical process that requires uh, you know, the craft of humans. And managing that process and going from that idea to that physical reality is still something that architects are, are absolutely instrumental in making sure happens and happens the way that's intended. And then lastly, of course, um, and it really maybe this gets back a little bit to that quality piece, is you really navigate AI and it's, and it's as a tool set, uh, to ensure they understand you know, essentially what's real, what's not. Um, what is in fact a design that's actually functional for a given project? Um, what is in fact uh, appropriate, safe, all those sort of things. And that's fundamentally um, from our perspective, at least when we look at AI, what it means to design, where the designer needs to start thinking and where we need to start thinking as a software. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to John and the implications from an educational perspective. Thank you, Roderick. And I think uh, a lot of the the, um, the issues that you're um, identifying in the profession is uh, these are the prompts that, that we think about in education because our job is to prognosticate and figure out how to position our students to, to go uh, in confidently into a, a future that is changing so quickly. Um, so some of the things that we look at are uh, things outside of our, our narrow remit, uh, say if we're a design school, um, say teaching architects, we're also going to be looking at say trends in art, uh, trends in fashion, tre trends in other kinds of, of arenas that, that can give us insight into what might be coming down the pike. And so if we look at, at th this example, this first example is um, uh, something that, that hit the, the media in the summer. Um, and it was uh, basically, uh, uh, somebody who won an art show in, uh, in Colorado and made a lot of people very angry. Um, and so th this basically is an example of how current generation of, of AI can augment artists and designers activities. Uh, so tools like mid journey and, and Dolly, uh, they're already part of the designer's toolbox. Uh, in, in this example, uh, Jason Allen's AI generated work, uh, Teatro, uh, Valpre Special, taking first place in the digital category at the Colorado State Fair highlights the increasing role of artificial intelligence in the creative arts. It also raises important questions about the relationship between human creativity and, and AI generated art. Um, one important implication of Alan's work is that AI is capable of producing very high quality creative works that can compete with human generated art in certain contexts. Um, but it raises the question about the role of AI in that creative process. Um, should AI 
human-generated art be considered as equivalent to human-generated art in terms of, of its uh, artistic merit and, and the, the value of it? Um, and I mean, it goes back to kind of bored ape questions too. I mean, what is, what is that kind of, of uh, artifact and how do we value it? So it, these things are, are sort of um, converging and, and intersecting, say, blockchain and AI, and, uh, and why wouldn't they? So, uh, but uh, another implication of this work is um, the potential for AI to disrupt the traditional notions of artistic authorship and ownership. Um, so while Alan programmed the AI system that generated the work, the AI system itself played a significant role in creating the final artifact, the final product. And this raises a question about who should be credited as the author of an AI generated work, how um, intellectual property rights should be assigned and protected in that context. It's another question. Uh, so overall, Alan's success in the Colorado State Fair suggests that um, AI generated art is becoming increasingly accepted and recognized as a legitimate form of that kind of uh, creative expression. It also underscores, however, the need for ongoing dialogue and debate about the implications of, of AI-generated art for the creative arts, all the inter intellectual property rights and the future of artistic expression generally. Next slide, please. So if we think about these tools like MidJourney and OpenAI's uh, Dolly and ChatGPT, uh, these are fundamentally syntax-based. So they're not yet capable of semantic analysis or understanding um, um, the true interpretation uh, or, or interpreting themselves, but they'll respond differently to modifications between successive prompts. We'll get into that in a, in a minute. So basically what Alan had to do is give these prompts for 80 hours. So it's it's basically, it is human effort and time that is still required. Next slide, please. So according to uh, the OpenAI website, Dolly2 um, has learned the relationship between images and text used to describe them. And it uses a process called diffusion, which starts with a pattern of random dots and gradually alters that pattern uh, toward an image when it recognizes specific aspects of that image that are defined uh, in the syntax. So what if we extend that implication regarding the value of um, artists to the value of the designer's role in the age of AI? Like art, uh, design is a creative field that requires human creativity and intuition. However, AI is increasingly being used in the design process to generate ideas, optimize designs, automate repetitive tasks, uh, things that we were seeing in the Flux example 10 years ago, AI is coming back uh, from a slightly different angle with more sophisticated algorithms. Um, the use of AI in the design process raises similar questions, though, about the role of AI in the creative work, the potential for AI to disrupt tradition, traditional notions of authorship and ownership, and the value of AI-generated designs compared to those generated by humans. Next, next uh, slide, please. So um, according to OpenAI's uh, uh, DALI, they, they are, the tool is able to do um, a lot with this kind of diffusion, um, but it's all predicated on human trained databases. Uh, so these databases as such have not yet begun to evolve on their own. They still need a human, a participant to decide what is and what is not an acceptable product. Um, so I, I just want to show you these two things. I actually uh, gave it two prompts. One on the top, I said, quote, office interior. That was it. And this is what it spit out, the one on the top. And then the one on the bottom, I actually uh, basically entered that, what you see on the slide, and it gave me something maybe more akin to what I'd like to see in an office space. So depending on what it what the the AI hears, it's going to, to sort those those pixels into something that looks like something that I might say yes to. Right? Um, so while AI can generate designs optimized for certain criteria like functionality, ergonomics, aesthetics, um, 
that can also lead to more efficient and effective design process, as well as new design um, possibilities that would be difficult or maybe even impossible for humans to conceive. So it can actually prompt different kinds of, of pathways for, for me to decide. Um, next slide, please. So this is a uh, this is not AI, right? This is basically looking at a a way of dealing with education and uh, and design prompts that come from experience and come from education and practice. So, for instance, this is just these are um, uh, sort of showing schemas, different schemas for um, color theory applied to any kind of scene, any kind of object, any kind of uh, artifact that we might design. So if I want to know what the color of something is, and I want to make a um, uh, a scheme that may be pleasing, harmonious, I might choose one of these um, well understood uh, schemas. So uh, whether that's tetradic with four different colors, monochromatic with just one, uh, one particular hue, and all the variants, uh, tints, tones, and shades of that hue, or triadic or any of these others, I can say that into the AI and it would know then um, somewhat how to uh, edit out its own kinds of, of um, options. So the, the role of traditional education and terminology in a syntax-based kind of uh, relationship with the computer is really important. How do we, um, how do we train our own vocabulary um, in order to ask for the right thing? That's, that's a, an example of the kinds of things that I think are going to persist in education when we're dealing with a kind of syntax, uh, I have to enter this into the computer uh, scenario. Next slide, please. However, there are alternatives to that syntax um, heavy human computer interface um, that are currently being used in Dali and, and Mid Journey. So, and these things are developing very quickly. Um, so here you see a, um, an example of what it would look like if a computer is reading your brain waves. Uh, and this is actually real, this is not sci-fi. Um, so if you look at the, the image on the top, the teddy bear on the top, and the computer uh, reads your brain waves, it will interpret those brain waves to be the teddy bear on the bottom. Uh, same thing all, all the way across from uh, left to right. So we can see that that there are things that are are coming online that that are alternatives that, to that syntax based um, uh, entry. However, it really does, I think, push even more to the to the fore that architects and designers' primary jobs are not really to generate uh, drawings or images, but to exercise and execute um, with good judgment. And so that's the that's that kind of uh, point that Roderick was making with respect to what it is that the designer is really here to do, and that is to bring things, uh, in some cases, in many cases, especially in the AEC field, into the physical uh, reality. So it's not enough to say I'm going to draw something. I am responsible as a um, as an architect uh, or a design professional to make sure that we are. Uh, actually delivering the, the thing that's appropriate to the design brief. Next slide, please. <laughs> so when we think about the tools that we currently use, things like um, Revit or Rhino or um, 3ds Max in conjunction with tools um, that, that help us to visualize, like Enscape, uh, like Chaos, uh, you know, things that are depending on which, which industry we're dealing with, whether it's gaming or that's remains um, in the virtual or something that will ev or eventually be physically manifested, we are responsible for doing the, the work in the most efficient way possible. And some of these tools, these geometric modelers, allow us to, um, to exercise our professional judgment in a kind of shorthand because we get used to using these tools and we can go very quickly without going through either hooking ourselves up to brainwave monitor or trying to uh, enter syntax into um, a kind of uh, verbal or uh, text-based uh, prompt box. It's about um, bringing our unique perspective 
that is um, that's shaped by our training, our experience, and our cultural background. Architects, designers, they have the ability to see beyond the technical constraints and parameters of a project to create designs that are innovative, innovative and functional, and also aesthetically compelling. So uh, in short, while uh, AI can generate images and models, the role of the architect or designer is to bring creativity, intuition, expertise, and the human touch to the design process. Uh, the best designs are often the result of a collaborative process that integrates the insights and capabilities of AI with the vision and creativity of human designers. So if you look at these seven C's that are, are here, these are, are sort of uh, future-proof um, factors. If you are engaged in these kinds of things as a human being, you're likely going to be still doing that in the in the near future, in the uh, mid future, and maybe even into the distant future, because they are fundamentally human. Um, yes, the AI is evolving uh, quickly with our help, um, but there's things like care. If you look at at how many nurses are still needed in the economy right now, it's just you can't we can't find enough nurses. Um, They've, they're dealing with the empathy issue, the care issue, and also the physicality issue. So that's one, you know, another example in another field or domain that, that kind of speaks about the same things that we are, are looking at uh, as well in our AEC field. So next uh, slide. So things like, you know, how are we going to uh, optimize a, a building um, structure and massing? We will bring these kinds of things in collaboration with our, our AI systems within our uh, regular geometric modelers. And we'll talk about them. We'll figure out, well, what is the most important thing? What are the kinds of, of um, what are the priorities that we've got? And that's, I think, a very important thing to think about as we figure out, well, what's what are computers good for and what are human being designers really uh, great at doing? So I wanna just uh, end with the last slide the key takeaways we have. So we are anticipating that extended reality, that's AR, VR, MR, will continue to evolve in 2023, along with increases in carbon awareness, uh, uh, energy efficient buildings and hybrid work practices. We think that the metaverse is unlikely to reverse its current downward trend or gain popularity in 2023 without significant changes, but those changes will likely um, uh, be in, uh, integrated after, I think, what what is it that Zuckerberg calls it, the year of efficiency ends. So artificial intelligence is another thing uh, we we believe will eventually become a very powerful tool to augment the design process with uh, the correct training within the AEC industry and beyond. And then finally, with the inclusion of AI within higher education curriculum, it's a um, it, that's a priority and largely unstoppable. More advanced conceptual skills are critical to properly use AI to reinforce the learning requirements and standards for uh, the responsibilities that uh, future designers will have to face. So with that, I'm gonna, I think we kind of hit our mark. I, I, we think we have maybe uh, nine or 10 minutes to uh, to take some questions. That's right, John. And uh, there are questions there are. The audience um, has quite been stirred up by this discussion of AI, as you <laughs> might expect. Um, so I'll jump right into what we have going on here. Uh, Ronnie um, says, it seems the emotional connection is not met with AI. Uh, any thoughts about that? What's not met? The emotional connection. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at things, there's that, there's something of the uncanny valley that I think it persists. Uh, we, we see this in uh, kind of animation and trying to, to create verisimilitude between a human uh, expression and something that is, is computer generated. And I think that 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 will persist for some time. I think there's always going to be this kind of thing because the hand, the eye, and the mind work together in a kind of synthetic way that's immediately that, that's immediate and and uh, recognizable by another human being. So yeah, there's a little funkiness going on in there, and I think that that will persist. Robert, what do you think? I think it will persist to, to some degree, but I think also it comes down to how people know something is created. Um, you know, if I know something is created by a person or say I'm, I'm talking to a person on the phone for help with you know, some service or something, there's a, an emotional component that's inherent in that communication because I know it's either it's generated by a person or I'm interacting with a person that has feelings and things like that. 
Uh, with AI, what's interesting to me, it comes down to almost a, a degree of, of honesty. If I don't know it's AI and I'm able to be fooled, then I suppose there is that emotional component. Um, and, I, and I'm in fact being deceived into having an emotional component that really is supposed to be predicated upon a human interaction or um, the human input of effort and craft. Um, so I think that gets a little bit to this idea of authenticity. Um, and in fact, when I see a really great piece of architecture, knowing that it came from the idea of a person, um, that almost lends a degree of emotionality to the design itself, my experience of it. And, and I frankly am a little worried that in the future, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be lied to um, in some ways. And it, I'm going to have an emotional response to things that were AI generated, where I don't feel that's honestly something that I want. I want to have that emotional response in, in relation to what people are and artists are trying to elicit from me. So um, Harvey um, <clears throat> has quite a, a, a little bit of background about himself to, to preface his question. So he says, as an old school architect that drew and rendered his design concepts in marker, pen, and ink, it seems like AI creates a menu of canned images based on entered criteria. That makes the designer a customer selecting which meal he wants to eat from the menu that the computer generates, although possibly substituting mashed potatoes for fries, rather than the designer creating an image to match requirements. So then the question, where does responsibility for creation start? And is it with the designer of the algorithm or the AI uh, itself? I'd say it depends on how it's being used. Um, and I think if you really are using a design by prompt exercise, it's almost a, a trial. It's, it's designed by trial and error um, is what you're doing it with something like that. And there the tool takes on an enormous amount of responsibility and the designer just becomes almost like a curator. Like, yes, I like it. No, I don't. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, the software takes precedent in a circumstance like that. Um, I suspect, and I'm I'm more comfortable at least with like as often the case in new technology, a more hybrid approach, where as a, like say in the context of Enscape, we have a lot of, of more manual inputs or other products in, under the chaos portfolio, such as V-Ray, have a high level of nuance that people can manipulate in a way that's very intentional. And what I would like to see, at least from an AI perspective, is one where it doesn't uh, remove the designer. So it's like you can say it's French fries or mashed potatoes, and you're just choosing from a menu of what you want the design to be. But rather, you can use the AI as a mechanism for inputting prompts that would manipulate a number of things that you could do otherwise, but it's just a lot easier to tell it what to do um, than to actually do it yourself. And that, that to me, is a nice way of perhaps negotiating that particular challenge. John, you have something to add to that? Sure. I, I mean, this is kind of what we were looking at with the... With the um... Uh, exam the first example of the artist work. So if you look at the at the rendering of the of the work that won the prize, um, you know it's it depends. On, and, and he was very honest. He said, "This is what I did. This is how I did it. And here's the artifact." And they and basically through that kind of honest kind of sharing, there was a uh, an agreement that this image, however it was was created, was the one that was going to win. Now there were other people who were there with the traditional media without the the aid of the the augmented you know uh, process that were understandably angry confused but they were they were in this same category where it it, it wasn't off the menu you could you could use this so the idea of this this uh, way of of working it I don't think it's necessarily saying well you can't do this you can't do that if you want to use that and you think you can get something out of it, go ahead. I think it's it's really a matter of what it is that you're trying to ultimately deliver to a client. If that is if that's something that is helping you to generate ideas, and this is what we're seeing, a lot of it is just like generating these these kinds of um, uh, wall of images, saying say is anything like this prompting me to then go in deeper. My opinion is that the tool. If you are going to, you know, use this as a as a finished um, render, uh, or rather rendering, if you use the the, uh, the I think the, the vocabulary that I use you know, use when I grew up, but whether it's a render or rendering, there are these kinds of 
of um, a comfort level, a, uh, a verisimilitude, an accuracy, a precision. I think it's harder to make to use this tool to come up with something that you have in mind. You have it in your in your head, and if you're trying to to sketch it with with those techniques, whether it's a, a, a orthogonal you know drawing or a paraline drawing or a perspective drawing or a sketch that's lyrical with watercolor or something like that, there are these tools that are are available that are traditional that can sometimes be very very quick, very fast to get a, a, a precise idea uh, rendered and communicated to uh, a client. I think that's really where it comes down to it. How well does it help you to communicate the idea that you have in your mind about a particular project? And these things can get very complicated very quickly. So if you layer on these other processes, these um, you know cybernetic processes, it can actually make it harder for you to, to get closer to the thing that you want. Now, will, will maybe a, a personal AI that is trained on your own um, kind of work habits maybe come in later on? Possibly. It's not there yet that I've seen. Or a much more uh, negative interpretation is that people just become lazy and say, what AI generates is good enough, and I'm going <laughs> to stick with that. And hopefully that's not what happens. I, I would hope that this audience today is not necessarily looking for that. Because at that point, you know, we, I think standards, it's not they even drop, they just disappear altogether yeah. because everything is, you know, it's something that looks like, I mean, and to use the, the uh, writer's example, it's maybe it's a potato, but I don't know if it's a French fry or if it's a mashed potato <laughs> and I don't really care, but I really do care. And so it's this kind of bespoke um, requirement that I, I want, I want a mashed potato. I do not want a French fry. And if I get a French fry, I'm going to send it back. Well, with that, I'm getting hungry, guys, and we are all out of time. Um, thank you so much for this very lively conversation. I think it's incredibly interesting. Uh, AI is going to be to continue to be uh, a subject at the forefront of everyone's mind for uh, some time to come, and I look forward to checking in next year to see how uh, your predictions uh, pan out. Um, so do so, I. <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much for attending the live webinar. 2023 Trends, a look at the biggest trends in the AEC industry, a CE Strong webinar series powered by the Architects newspaper. This presentation was sponsored by Enscape. This webinar is recorded and can be easily replayed using the same registration link. Please allow seven business days to process certificate of participation and AIA credit for this presentation. And with that, I wish you all a happy day and we'll see you next time. <laughs>